Well, good afternoon. I am uh, the Reverend Helen Van Coovering, and um, I'm going to share just some uh, news that I've that I have of uh, both my own experience, but the women that I worked with, particularly in the Mothers Union in Northern Mozambique. So on being missionary, a complicated love, as you, you'll see at the bottom there. I enjoy saying that uh, life in Mozambique and mission in Mozambique was complicated like that, splitting the con and the pliar, it's with folds. And so the, the life that we had there was uh, one with many folds to it, many sides to it. And I just want to explain some of that as I go through here. And partly because since I've been in this country in the last six years, I've heard a lot about um, not just hearing the single story, uh, which comes from Chinamanda Adichie in a TED talk in 2009, not just thinking mission is one thing or that um, the life of women in poorer parts of the world is just one thing. Okay, so just to very briefly put it all out there about my entire life. Somebody said to me recently, what a rich life. It's true that um, I've spent something like 28 or so years in Southern Africa, um, going from Britain, as you can hear, to Zimbabwe and the Beira Corridor in Mozambique, particularly going there in the midst of war. Uh, two sets of wars that happened in Mozambique, 1964 to 74 was the war for independence, fought mainly, mainly in the north. So when you hear southern, southerners and people in Maputo, the capital, say that there was a 16-year war, the one they're uh, referring to is 1977 to 92, which we called the War of Destabilization, which was um, a civil war fought with support from outside. So I met and married my husband in 1990. We met in Maputo and went up to Nyasa, which is one of the northernmost um, provinces of Mozambique. We had a period of six years when we went for seminary education in Bristol and to our first church that we shared in ministry in Wales. We were ordained um, in the Diocese of Monmouth with our, well, it was just the Bishop of Monmouth at that point, Rowan Williams. And then my husband was elected to go as the bishop back out to the Diocese of Nyasa, the same place that we had lived all those years before. And during this whole time, I just wanted to list my different experiences of working with women, with families, with children that went from working with the Christian Council of Mozambique with displaced children to um, publishing what I had studied whilst in Bristol as Dancing Their Dreams. And that um, is why I always have a focus on the dance of women as a way of expressing their deepest dreams and, and thoughts. Um, and then we, uh, the post-war, uh, after 1992, just different ways that I was involved with the Mothers Union, particularly as a diocesan president um, down in our own provincial and also on the worldwide um, council of the Mothers Union, so I know it pretty well. We, for a short period of time, I was involved with the different forestry projects with the Swedish church that came to our diocese and got to know the situation of female headed households. And apparently almost a third of households in Northern Mozambique are female headed, as they say. Um, I was very involved as the director of ministry for our diocese in community priesthood. And through that program, the first two women were ordained and you will have seen one of them in the worships uh, that, that was recorded yesterday. I also led to different churches there as, as a priest. Um, and I've, I've recently, well, 2017, completed Mission from the Middle, which was my demon at VTS in Alexandria. And since 20, at the end of 2015, we moved from Mozambique to here, mainly looking towards retirement and the needs to bridge, having lived in the eighth poorest country of the world to this country where our three children were. And we have worked in the Diocese of West Virginia and are presently in the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. So I just visually wanted to put there that uh, mission is a multi-dimensional story. As I said at the beginning, there's not a single story. It's not 
one of adventure all the time or joy all the time or even pain and hurt all the time and right in my very first year when I was in Zimbabwe I went home at Christmas and our local newspaper put this pe this picture um, of me did a little story on me and I like the title learning to love and that that went from that time in Zimbabwe which I know um, is special to other people in in Gem as well and through to northern Mozambique which is that whole map there um, from the Zambezi River up was the Diocese of Nyasa. It's one and a half times the size of the UK, and I, I can't really measure that with, within this country. Uh, very enormous and bad roads and poorly developed. And I know that these are words that I've, I've chosen to talk about um, joining in with God's mission, with God's church. It is God's mission. It is God's church and and we have different ways of coming into that we we talk about God's call on our lives and for me um, that has always been uh, for me seen in Isaiah 58 uh, 11 that very famous passage about uh, fasting and then there was another one which talks more about hardship and the humor that is living in such a different culture a different place different um lifestyle and that was about stretching out on short beds which was particularly meaningful when I read that in Isaiah 28 and we were on a trip up our lakeshore and people literally uh, had strung beds that they were offering to us that were just too short and too small and and it was just a depiction of some things are just hard and the puffs of wind which is about wisdom in all this and that actually the wisdom that we bring as people um, as we as we move along is 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 only a small puff of wind in the wisdom of God in these in the in our lives and in these different places where we find ourselves I wasn't going to read those passages to you but if you wanted to note them then please do so it's always important I think to um, let people know that um, women working in, Mo in northern Mozambique particularly are working within an impoverished um, um, environment and recently I've heard about multi-dimensional poverty and I, I have heard over all these years that I've been in, involved in mission there of different ways of measuring what truly is poverty and this new way actually brings out um, worse poverty diametrics than I had heard before. Um, it's about multidimensional poverty, it's about it has different ways of measuring ordinary people's access to public services and talking about their dignity and their well-being. And these are some of the statistics that I find in, in that, that 18 to 89% in northern Mozambique are uh, living in multidimensional poverty. Um, life expectancy is at 58 years, and I know at the end of the war in 1992, it was 47 years. Um, 3.2 million Mashambas, that's small family farms, create 95% of the agricultural production of the country and 71% of all jobs. And I have to say, don't assume that that's done by men. It is mainly women farming in their own Mashambas. Uh, high illiteracy. Um, and, and the reason I am so um, wanting to be involved in, in things to do with climate and the um, the difficulties at the moment is because Mozambique is the eighth most vulnerable to climate change. And you might have heard of some terrible storms that ha have happened over the last couple of years that have um, flattened the city of Beira and then north into um, Nampula and, and above into Cabo Delgado. Um, So the Diocese of Nyasa, in the time that we were there, um, we were able to measure some of the some of the changes that were happening because it was it was truly since the war finished in 1992 there there has been great um, movement at, of people movement and also great growth of the church in every way that you want to measure it, and we just saw it as God's time for Northern Mozambique. Um, we were able to measure it and be part of that from 2003 um, up until we left in December 2015. And I just want to go through north of the Zambezi River, pre the new 
um, existence of since last, I think September in last year, when it became the Anglican province of Mozambique and Angola, the Portuguese speaking. Um, and they've now made the one pro the one diocese that we we were working within uh, is now four. Um, and we, we went in the whole of the Diocese of Nyasar as it was from baptized members of tw around 25,000 to 66,000. We went from 243 congregations to 442. Um, I was asked at, when I was at VTS to actually measure the people movement that happened and not just the size of our churches. And we were still about 2% above the growth of the population at that time, as people were moving around, having gained confidence to return to their, to their land and to, um, to, to, to where they had left before the war. I would like to head up here, the fact of the Mother's Union's growth and uh, we had one community development coordinator that, that worked with all these new churches and congregations that were growing. We began with something like 945 members in 2003 to 3,700 by the middle of 2015. And that was a, a movement of women because they had been given um, um, a vision to, to be the pastoral workers of the churches. They were the ones who prayed. On Thursdays, we had a service um, that they prayed for the sick and, and then would go and visit. They, they established different groups of the Mother's Union in order to support women in the ministries that they had with those different churches. And this was lay led. If, I don't know that it could have happened without the community development worker that we had at that time. St. Agnes groups there were also, um, it was a girls group that grew in, in um, that, would, that had been in Malawi and we'd heard about it through Bishop Tenga Tenga. And um, during this time, the Mother's Union took that on themselves to establish Ag St. Agnes groups in about 170 of all those churches um, as, as they were growing. And also during the time um, of our, our, our presence there, uh, was a growth in understanding that women who had been leaders of the Mother's Union could now be catechists in their churches with a little bit more training. And then also that's where from training of uh, to, make, to have women who had been in leadership of the Mother's Union to be catechists was where then two women rose up to be the first two of Mozambique. Oh, let me just say, we talked about that growth as it was just a, a, a running after the spirit. It was something that I truly believe was a, a move of God's spirit. And um, it was not to do with the leadership that was there because there were only, as you see there, 61 clergy, and that included the bishop. It was, it was a lay led movement that just proved God's time for that part of the world. And so the Mother's Union has been variously spoken of both by themselves uh, in, in our diocese, as well as by different bishops and the archbishops of Canterbury. The Mother's Union mission in my time there, I heard uh, a bishop call it um, God transforming a church to transform a nation. The Mother's Union brings women to the core of this transformation. And uh, uh, one of the women in my own church, a uh, member of the Mother's Union, um, called it a mirror of the church. If, if we can see the women moving, the women in ministry and mission, that is because the church is, but they are the hidden ones. They are the ones that will not be named in, in that. And yet um, they are the backbone of the church in more ways than you can imagine. And I've just come to see that some of the ways that were used to describe the, uh, their work by themselves, as well as by their, their congregations, was actually in some of the songs that were sung. And there is a beautiful song, Moyo Wangu, that's my, my heart. And you see in the top right hand corner, they're actually singing that and, and giving their hearts to their congregation, to their leadership. This is our heart. This is us together. And I've just been struck that love is all 
is already there as well. Just as we talk about God is already ahead of us when we go in mission, we have to discern where God is and move into that. Love is already there as well. It's not something that will be taught from outside. It is there and is something definitely for us to learn from and the expression of those in, these, in the communities and in the women's lives. And there are some key things that I think the Mother's Union taught me. Uh, one of them is that circle on the, on the left there about mission from the middle and that the middle is where the province is. I don't think the Mother's Union works in the hierarchical way that possibly some might look at it. I think it is strongest at the grassroots, at the smallest of groups, and then going into the parishes and, the, and then the areas or whatever we call the archdeaconries, the diocese, and then the province, going right through to Mary Sumner House in London. But, but it is not on, on a hierarchical level. It's that you have a secretary, for example, in one level, you will have that in the next level and it goes out that way. But the strength of it is in the grassroots. So when I discovered that um, finances towards the community development coordinators had changed, I was thinking that maybe some of the strength of the Mother's Union is, is going to dissipate with that as well. Because I, I, I do think that something that I also saw happen was the nurturing of emerging leaders, followers of Jesus at the grassroots, moving by their faith and their ability to move with that um, into all sorts of different works. We heard from Carolyn yesterday about a lot of things that I would call mission in, in our understanding as it developed there of what church is, worship, mission and ministry. And there they were, um, we heard from Carolyn yesterday about getting getting voices heard in key areas of land and inequalities and justice. But we also saw how the Mother's Union was very involved in ministry, very involved in worship. Those St. Agnes groups with girls, very much bringing girls into the liturgy of churches. And um, we had retreats for them, all sorts that, that uh, was nurtured by those Mother's Unions. And maybe one of the reasons being that it was the older women who, who led that. The, the bishop before us there uh, often would say to me that it was that the, the church existed through the leaving of all the missionaries in 1975 with independence um, to actually then all those wars and, and times of, of terrible warfare and and the men had left for work in other places and children were in other countries like Malawi for security and in refugee camps. It was the women of the Mother's Union that kept the church going and that stayed. And I want to show you some faces of women because I absolutely believe that a mission is to do with meeting face to face. And I, I, I subconsciously had picked these pictures that you will see in the next few slides of women and, and their faces looking at us with different emotions. I want to point out Vovo Monica Masosa there on the left, particularly. She was the uh, subject and her family of my uh, Dancing Their Dreams, the book that was published and um, of, of my M. Phil, published back in 2005. She died um, just a couple of years ago and she's been um, instrumental in the Mother's Union growing throughout, the, throughout Northern Mozambique and never with any transport, always walking and committed to what she was doing. Um, through to Gloria, who is on the right, and she was the president when, the president of the Mother's Union when, when uh, I left there in, in, in 2015. Maria Mkambula is also very involved with some health projects that were doing great things up the northern part of the lake shore. So she was a great organizer for women. And Elise Chipola, I have grown old with. We had children the same age. We went through all that mothering and learning our new roles and our new uh, work together. And these are the community development coordinators that we worked with um, um, during that time of, of uh, from 2003 to 2015. Sylvia, I, I chose a picture which just depicted her, a great prayer warrior. Um, I chose Rosa because um, she, she was almost like the right hand 
woman for the clergy, for the, for the churches, for our church, for the Mother's Union. Uh, she would go fearlessly when there was any flooding happening and organize the women into groups that were, were um, then going to sustain communities that had had all this uh, trauma. And um, Isabel on the other side, who was working with her in the diocese of Z in the area as it was then of Zambasia. So they, they worked together uh, to cover our enormous diocese of, of that time. And then these are the two women, Albertina and Claudina, who are the first two women ordained in Mozambique. Uh, alongside Hilario, and I think about um, four other people at the same time, we'd had a group of seven um, men and these two women who went through a three-year course with, with me and, and my colleagues, uh, training to be community priests. And one day I remember asking them how many um, churches they were actually touching as catechists at that point, because that was a prerequisite for the training to be community priests. And it came to something like 36 different churches through these seven people. The job was just enormous, reaching, reaching around very remote areas and new areas known to our church. And I'd also come to see the, the, the um, capolana, which are those cloths that women wear, as actually a reflection of not just in dance times, but in um, just the spirituality of women. Here, uh, I, I just would like to talk about what I've learned about women in mission from the Mother's Union in Northern Mozambique. I've learned that women are beautiful. I've learned that still they dance always. There is a woman, a journalist from South Africa who wrote this book in 1989 called And Still They Dance, Women War and the Struggle for Change in Mozambique. Um, women just constantly finding the um, strength from being uh, together. Um, and somehow the Capilana actually, for me, became some way that they were they were finding that security wrapped in the signs of God's presence. It's very practical. That is used for that cloth is used for carrying all sorts of things, for wrapping their own bodies, for putting on tables, for sleeping under at night, for carrying babies. And it's um, uh, there are regional ways of wearing it as well, which depicted where they also belonged. It's that it's important to actually highlight women. Um, in Northern Mozambique, I came to see also as a reflection of the culture that had been matrilineal there. I had worked on the Beira Corridor for a little bit with women that were coming into the security of the camps during the war along there. But when I went to Northern Mozambique, even though I felt like women were in a more impoverished environment, there was a dignity there that I came to see as something to do with the matrilineal uh, understanding of for example, the ch who the children belong to themselves. Men, um, which is maybe why the, the women headed households are so much more in Northern Mozambique. Men had left when poverty became too much um, or during the war and, and the women were left looking after their children. So the Capilanas could be seen as um, um, a uniform, if you like. So when, when there were deaths, when there were celebrations, women would share their capilanas with each other. We would have a celebration in the church and they would buy new capilanas, just that all the women would be together in that. I also came to see it as something to do with the understanding of life death, um, that it's a big cycle that, that comes from African traditional religion. And it's important that you spend time at funerals, you spend time just remembering those who who have died and uh, the spirit that, that is left uh, of their presence with, with, with us. Um, I'm going through a little bit quickly because we lost some time back there as well. Um, I recently read uh, something about St. Teresa of Lisieux and was interested to see how she also described herself as being carried at the breast, supported in the arms of God, being lifted up to God. And, and I, I wonder if that's not something that the Capilana would also um, allow for women to feel that they were being held as they held their children. 
And a capilana isn't just that Jesus walks alongside you, but that you are walking in the body movement of Jesus. You are there held by um, a God that doesn't leave you, that um, you, you may be going through all sorts of trauma and sorrows, as well as joys and, and uh, good times, tears and dreams, but somehow that deep awareness that women are held um, in that, in, 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 in that Kaplan there and in the spirituality. In fact, to the point that uh, I remember a conversation with some people who came to visit about how you would describe the spirituality that we knew in Nyasa. Was it African evangelical? Was it missional? Whereas I came to see because of the Kapalana and, and, the, um, and the presence that that meant and the quietness that that brought, that um, perhaps it's almost like an African Ignatian spirituality. God doesn't abandon. God goes ahead of us. There is wisdom and there is a forever presence of God with us. So, um, I would like to just uh, give you this map of what has happened. It, with the growth that was there, uh, the church has now multiplied um, recently, and it's including Angola in the Anglican Church of uh, Mozambique and Angola, but here I have Mozambique. And you can see here that four northern dioceses that are now part of what we knew as the Anglican Diocese of Nyasa. And um, I know the, I know these, these bishops, Bishop Manuel, who's up there uh, top right. He actually worked with me in the, the Department of Ministry and was also actually um, a deacon with me uh, in those last few years before we left. It's, it's wonderful to see the church growing as it has and, um, and moving and moving in with wonderful leadership. The, the Bishop Carlos Mazzini here at the bottom here um, is, the is in the Diocese of La Bombage and he is the presiding Bishop of Ayama. And he also is uh, a dear friend. He was the priest who married Mark and I uh, back in 19... 90s, so we have special memories with, with all of these. I just want to leave you with, I think we just have a couple minutes left. I was sent this last Saturday morning. I woke up to this on my WhatsApp from Bishop Manuel uh, as everyone had gathered to, to um, elect a new bishop for the Diocese of Nyastra and the women wanted me to receive this. So I share it with you, it's just a minute. What they are singing is a prayer to the pastors, for the pastors, that they will gather their people at this time. And when they were running to each other, they were saying, we are coming, we are here. Oh. So I'd just like to finish with a prayer that I translated into English that came from the worship yesterday. Um, from Moasiti, who is a woman who is working with um, displaced people in Cabo Gardu, and she sent this prayer. Father God, you taught us and showed us the love that accompanies us. We thank you for love that inspires us to serve others, brothers and sisters in the world, with and through love. Call more men and women for your mission, especially amongst the displaced in Cabo Delgado. Strengthen our brothers and sisters in their commitment to your mission to the world in your love. Help us to build communities in love because with your love, nothing fails. Amen. Now, if I can move my, yeah.
sorry, I'll go back a minute. This is the prayer that we used to pray as AXA, the Church of Southern Africa, for Portuguese, in Portuguese. Deus abençoe Africa, protege as nossas crianças, protect our children, transform as nossas líderes, transform our leaders, cura as nossas comunidades, heal our communities, restaura a nossa dignidade, give us back our dignity, e dá-nos a paz, give us peace. Pelo amor de Cristo. Amen. So in the last few minutes that we have, I'd just also like to um, leave you with some questions that we can talk about just in our own group here, but also just to describe here, show you these two forms of art that have been created in Mua Mission in Malawi. It's a Catholic mission, and they've looked at African traditional religion, which is actually the framework um, behind the backdrop behind um, almost everything that is happening. There is a difference between belief and faith um, and, and lots, of, lots of people standing with a foot in two places. But I, it, I'll show you the picture of this is Chauta, the name for God, who is up and remote in up there and sending the spirits of animals and people down. Um, to earth and you can see how actually bringing Jesus into that picture was quite a clear easy way really of continuing what is African traditional religion. It's in many times just a continuation of understanding of what is life and, and some discontinuities that were brought in because of the original um, mission that went there, uh, a different understanding of, of, of faith. Uh, one of those discontinuities was that women um, in a matrilineal society had uh, to learn a whole new way of being family, of being female in that faith there. I would also like to just show, and, and that's where the Mother's Union um, became a, a transformative organization for women there because it allowed them to find leadership in the new the new environment the new uh, religion that came in and let me just show you this other wood carving there is Chauta in in the top and then the nativity scene at the bottom and who Jesus is depicted there Jesus the warrior for his people but also Jesus the caller to to um, prayer to, to leading people into prayer, a little bit as I imagined um, David would call people into prayer. So I just leave you with those questions. Who are the hidden missionaries in our churches today? The people that maybe don't even belong to a group that has that, or um, who I can think of women in my own church who, who are those people that are just quietly um, moving ahead uh, showing their faith in, in, in their everyday lives. What is God, is God doing a new thing in our midst here? And what is that new thing? Or do we just carry on doing what we've done ever since, ever since the Episcopal Church came here or any church that might be listening here? Do we just carry on doing the new thing, the, new, the vision that we heard 20, 30, 40 years ago? Or is there something new? And where is God's spirit leading us? in mission today.